Three months ago, I ended Breath of the Wild's longest world record drought at 10 and a half months. The 2323 was the cleanest run I've ever done, and a lot of the time save was thanks to new strats. So to give people an idea of what's been changing in Breath of the Wild any percent, as well as an introduction for those who aren't familiar with the speedrun, I'll be commentating over a run, talking about what's new and how everything works to beat the game as fast as possible. But, because I'm sure a lot of you have already seen the 2323, I'll be using footage directly from my sum of best. Because not only did I lower the world record by 19 seconds, I hit another huge milestone dropping my sum of best just below 23 minutes. A player's sum of best is a combination of their best segments that's tracked by their splits to give an idea of how fast a run would be if the player played perfectly. I happen to keep the video files around, so I thought it'd be fun to give people a sneak peek at what it could look like once we finally reach that next minute barrier. That being said, this is not a valid speedrun. It's a spliced together video to show the theoretical time a runner could get with the strats that I've currently deemed to be consistent enough to be worth going for. So let's get into the run. One of the first things people notice is that the game is played in French. That's because in Breath of the Wild, voice acted cutscenes and dialogue can take different amounts of time depending on the language. For any percent, that means French is the fastest, saving around 4 seconds over English because we gain control of Link much faster after picking up the Sheikah Slate. With this slate in hand, we can officially start the run, and Breath of the Wild has an incredibly quick start. The first major skip is clipping out of the Shrine of Resurrection. By running into the corner and using the scope with a precise camera angle, we turn Link around instantaneously, putting him on the other side of the wall. This skips all the long cutscenes we would normally watch walking out the front door. It also locks the time of day cycle, keeping Hyrule at a nice 5.15am, which isn't really relevant for any percent, but some longer categories benefit from the lack of weather and stall enemies. We clip back and bounce by uncrouching at a specific spot, and run straight to the nearby Boko camp. This gives us the almighty pot lid and a weapon, both of which are quite useful. The weapon type doesn't really matter anymore, so I pick up the torch when I can, because it's a little bit closer to Link, and you've got to keep those running lines as efficient as possible. Now, we should surf to the Zelda cutscene. Coming up next is the first shield clip of the run. Using the scope isn't the only way to get through walls. And now that we have the shield, we're able to store the angles of slopes, which we call skew, by shield jumping onto a sloped surface. It doesn't really look like a slope, but that's what I'm doing when I climb the wall next to the window. With skew, the next time you shield jump an unequipped shield, Link will snap back to the angle that was stored for one frame, and then return to his original orientation which clips him through. Here, we pick up the bow and arrows, completing our equipment set, getting us ready for a lot of fun glitches and tricks. Which brings us to the first BLSS or Bowlift Smuggle slide of the run, which I'll be explaining in a later segment because there just isn't enough time to explain it now. Just enjoy watching Link hover straight to the bomb shrine with a bow and pot in hand. Next, we perform a fall damage cancel by interrupting the weapon throwing animation with an equipment swap to land by the shrine without dying. And since we didn't go to the tower, the shrine is still dormant and we have to clip in using another shield clip. Luckily, we can reuse the skew that we had stored at the Temple of Time. Entering the shrine is a bit of a break from the action. Seriously though, we use basically every relevant trick for the entire run within the first 4 minutes, so it's kind of insane to try and explain it all in one go. But things will settle down in a few minutes once I've explained the key techniques. So now, we're in the Bomb Shrine, which comes first for two reasons. One, it's the closest to the Shrine of Resurrection, and two, it gives us the most powerful rune in the game. With bombs, we have access to one of the most fun techniques in Breath of the Wild, called the Wind Bomb, which, if you've heard of Breath of the Wild speedrunning, then you probably know what I'm talking about. By jumping forward, dropping a bomb, entering bullet time, dropping the second bomb, and then detonating the first bomb, we can launch a Link at high speeds due to a bullet time physics miscalculation when the second bomb hits Link. This specific setup is called Gamer Wind Bomb, and it uses a turn to get a very precise launch to the end of the shrine. And because this is the fastest I've ever completed the split, I landed exactly in front of the monk. The reason we're even completing the shrine instead of just leaving the Great Plateau using the hovering glitch from earlier, 
is that the game will void you out if you try and leave without the paraglider. And the only way to get it is to complete the shrines and receive it from the old man at the Temple of Time. This is a very strict check, and even after 7 years, we still can't skip it. The old man, who by this point we haven't seen before, flies down and wants to tell us something. But he's speaking in French so I have no idea what he's saying. What I do know is that the fastest dialogue options are 2112. This results in the fewest text boxes to mash through. Once he's done talking, there's the big drama part of the run. After you complete your first shrine, you gain access to the rune menu, and part of that is the amiibo rune. There is a no amiibo category, and you can go to speedrun.com and filter the leaderboard if that's a deal breaker for you. You might want to subscribe to whoever has the world record for that. I hear they're pretty cool. But amiibo scanning gives us access to a lot of useful ingredients. In this case, we're scanning Mipha and Toon Link to get Attack of Fish, which we'll be cooking later. With our fresh catch in hand, we can slide to the next shrine. And here you'll see another reason bombs are so powerful. BLSS requires an item to be picked up, but bombs can be spawned anywhere, so we can essentially BLSS whenever we want. And don't worry, I'll be explaining how BLSS works in the next split. We pass by the tower on this slide, which we skip because it has a really long cutscene to activate. And with clipping, the only benefit is that it allows you to activate the shrines as warp points, which we wouldn't use anyway. Now, and this is a YouTube video, and while I could remove the loads, I've decided to keep them in because unfortunately they're a big part of Breath of the Wild speedruns. You might be familiar with runs where load times are removed, but those are generally PC games where it's easier to track when the game is loading and automatically remove the time. Which means that, to get the fastest times, you need to get the fastest loads, which is annoying because they're very inconsistent. But I'll be making a whole separate video on that later, so stay tuned, it'll be loads of fun. Magnesis is the second shrine because it's the closest in horizontal as well as vertical distance. Once we climb up to Stasis and Cryo, we won't want to come back down for mag. But the rune itself isn't very useful. In fact, we only use it twice in the run. And this will be a trend for all the runes except bombs, but we still have to grab them because the monk at the end will send you back if you don't. To get to the end of the shrine, we do another wind bomb. And this is one of the first strat changes that I made to my runs recently. By slightly adjusting the setup, we can land next to the monk. But it deals more fall damage, so without extra food, Link has a chance of dying. Now that we've reached the end of another shrine, you can see that I intentionally wait to skip the cutscene after receiving the spirit orb. That's because waiting for the text to fully disappear before skipping results in faster load times. The game is loading the overworld during that cutscene, and skipping too soon will cause the load to restart. It saves around 5 seconds per shrine, so for any percent, it saves 20 seconds. Alright, it's time to explain BLSS. First, we do a bow lift smuggle by picking up an object while pointing out the bow, so that Link picks it up with his bow in hand. Then, by jumping, pressing B, and pausing, we can unequip his shield to interrupt the bow put away animation, sticking it and the object to Link. While in this state, stepping up onto a ledge will make Link hover. I think because the step up animation doesn't get affected by gravity, and with the smuggle active, we stay in the step up animation. The object's collision will propel him backwards faster and faster as we turn left and right. This slide is hard because we go up a slope which loses a lot of speed and we need to dodge the trees. Now we climb this tree and perform one of the most satisfying wind bombs in the game. We jump from the top of the tree to line up our bombs and with the proper aim we get just enough height to land next to the shrine. It's so perfect it almost feels intentional. Then we reuse the skew for Magnesis to clip in. Before we get to the next trick, I'd like to give a bit more context on wind bombs. The angle you get launched is largely determined by the part of the bomb you get hit by. When placing a bomb midair, it spawns in aligned with the cardinal directions. For maximum height, you want to get hit by the square bomb's face rather than its corner, which is why the aim for the tree wind bomb was so important. If we're slightly off, Link hits the cliff and dies. There's a lot more to wind bombs, but Link's facing angle is one of the most fundamental things to keep in mind. And now we have the stasis rune, which is only used once. We used to use it more, but newer strats make it obsolete. There's even a wind bomb that skips using it in the shrine, but I think it's a bit too difficult for now. By stopping the gear while the platform is raised a bit, we can get bullet time for a wind bomb. Q's thought of this a while ago, but I only started using it recently, which saved a couple of seconds but needs a strong launch. And that's why plateau wind bombs are so precise. 
Without the glider, there's no way to fix a wind bomb that's too weak or off to the side. You need to land exactly where you're trying to go. And now we're done with stasis, but I forgot to mention why it's third. The route with cryo third requires a bullet time bounce, which is harder than the wind bomb to get to stasis, while being roughly the same speed, so we just go with the easier route. This next wind bomb is one of the biggest new tricks. Normally, you would stasis the boulder to ride up the cliff, but we can use a wind bomb instead, which saves around 5 seconds. A normal front hop wind bomb doesn't give enough height, but a running square first with just the right bomb placements lands gently in the snow. Which brings us to another fairly tricky slide. This slide requires good steering because we need to go around the mountain since we mostly can't change our vertical height while sliding. We don't want too much speed initially because it would be going in the wrong direction, but we do need enough speed to unload the cold air. That's right, we literally move so fast that the temperature rises. To get into cryo, we do an extended shield clip. This is basically chaining two shield clips together to clip through thicker walls like shrine doors. It's fast, but we don't use it on every shrine because it's harder to do, partially because it's frame perfect. And reusing ski is already really fast, which wouldn't be possible using the ski we get for ESC. Now that we're here, do you ever miss cryo? Well, if you do, then too bad, because we never use it. Wind bombs made it actually obsolete. Back when bombs was last, Cry used to have the coolest strats, featuring a wall jump over the fence on the left, into a shield jump off a rising cryo block to get boosted up to the stairs. But now, it's a pretty run of the mill wind bomb. If you've noticed me shield jumping before all the wind bombs so far, that's called a quick fix, which fixes glitched ragdoll state. To keep things simple, Every time you shield jump and unequip your shield, like for shield clips, you get into a state where you won't enter ragdoll properly the next time you get hit. This quick fix temporarily gets rid of it, allowing us to wind bomb. Alright, so that's the most normal wind bomb in any percent, where you just have to press the buttons fast and ricochet off the wall to bounce in front of the monk. But it still might be my least favorite, because it's killed so many good runs from an unfortunate bounce off the wall. With the shrines complete and spirit orbs in hand, the old man comes back to give us one more cryptic instruction in French. Speaking of voice acting, you need to listen to the Italian old man, because he gives it his full 100%. <laughs> Italian is the fastest language for all dungeons, which I happen to currently be running, so if you're curious, check out my Twitch to witness it live in all its glory. But anyway, this split is just sliding to the Temple of Time, and because we ended on cryo, it's a straight shot. The step up is pretty cool. The way we jump onto the ledge consistently gives a very fast launch towards the Temple of Time. Then it's just a fall damage cancel and we've reached the end of the game's tutorial. Breath of the Wild is the first open world Zelda, so unlike the other games, it doesn't require you to complete any of the dungeons before you fight the final boss. The game was kind of designed for speedrunning. So we'll accept the challenge and make our first stop Hyrule Castle. But the thing that makes the endgame so interesting is that there's a boss rush that requires a lot of preparation to defeat. Weapons having durability means that we can't just rely on one or two strong weapons, we need a whole arsenal. Which makes the route we take through Castle super fun because we're trying to find the perfect balance between speed and strength. With the paraglider finally in hand, it's time for the longest BLSS of the run, introducing Hyrule's speed limit. The slides on Plateau are short enough that we don't reach the speed cap, but on the way to Castle, it's important to recognize how fast you're moving. If you exceed, I think it's 100 meters per second, then the goddess Hylia smites you, causing you to lose all your speed. So you need to hit the speed limit as fast as you can, and then slow your flicking down to maintain that top speed. BLSS decelerates when using bombs, so you can't fall asleep at the wheel. It's also a good time to point out that any freeze frames you're seeing are from moving faster than the game can load. Speaking of loads, we enter the castle through a gate that doesn't load in. Most of the time. According to current knowledge, it's random what parts of castle load in first, so if the gate appears, the run dies, since the backup clip loses a lot of time. Now, there's a lot of enemy manipulation in this section, which makes it feel different from Plateau and really fun. This headshot stuns the Moblin so we can freely pick up the Royal Claymore behind it, 
and get a sneak strike for the royal guards claymore. Then, the castle cutscene that usually plays when you first land finally loads in. Okay, here I break the box for a guaranteed razor shroom. But depending on fish RNG, this isn't necessary. My castle gold is weird because I have really clear time save from getting better RNG, but my BLSS to castle was just so fast that it's still hard to beat. We throw sprint up the stairs, which is basically whistle sprinting, but Link doesn't make as much noise to avoid alerting certain enemies. And then we pick up three ancient arrows. There was a whole castle reroute that focused on getting stronger weapons while also removing arrow RNG, and the ancient arrows are a big part of that since they deal so much damage. Throwing a bomb distracts the Lizalfos for a sneak strike, giving us the boomerang. Then we finally cook the attack of Mial. At level 3, this gives us a 1.5 times damage multiplier, reducing the number of weapons we need to grab. Now, the route becomes absolutely insane. We still clip out of bounds to take a more direct path to the top of the castle by using a mid-air wind bomb to get to the opposite hallway, avoiding the invisible walls and water planes. With another wind bomb, we get to Zelda's room, which has the last two weapons we need. The moblin doesn't load in immediately, so while we wait, we eat the attack of food and drop the bow to avoid a tutorial when we pick up the royal guard's bow. We then blow up a bomb in the moblin's face to stun it, giving us just enough time to run around and get a sneak strike. There are also 5 arrows on the ground, which is the perfect amount for what we need. And after one more wind bomb, we're ready for the boss rush. So, if you don't complete the Divine Beasts, the game sends the Blights back to Castle to defend Ganon, and they have to be defeated back to back without dying or you respawn at the start. Fortunately, we've got a few tricks up our sleeves, with the first one being Wind Blight Skip. We use a setup to place Link just outside of the cutscene trigger and aim at a specific texture on the wall so that when we enter the fight, it freezes our arrow where Windblight's head is. This constantly deals headshot damage as we let the cutscene play, which kills the first Blight in a single shot. You can see its head shaking to show that it worked. Which brings us to Water Blight, where we see the first of many two-hand weapon spins. Here, we wait for the lunge attack so we can spin for triple hits to end it super fast. The blades are extremely streamlined, where all the durability is accounted for, making it really satisfying to get cleanly, but also really difficult to learn. The goal of every phase is to defeat the blight before it can warp away, which we call a one cycle. Phase 2 Water Blight used to be the last one we couldn't one cycle, because we can't really hit it while it's in the air, and when you knock it down, it'll get up too quickly. But Onyx came up with a pretty creative solution. By throwing the boomerang and intentionally missing headshots, you can deal extra damage before knocking Water Blight down, which gives us just enough time to finish it off with a Royal Claymore. Fireblade Phase 1 is pretty easy. We just spin the Royal Claymore, and then switch to the Royal Guards Claymore to spin again to move on to Phase 2, before it can even attack. There is a bit more nuance to the spins, but it mostly boils down to spin as soon as you can. Fun fact, you can use Bomb Arrows to get rid of Fireblade Shield. You should try it next time you're in Rudania. We don't have any, so we use a bomb to destroy its shield and knock it down. Then we do two hits with the boomerang and throw it for a third that deals a little bit more damage before spinning with the royal claymore. This one cycle is pretty tricky since you need to target fire blight as it's getting up so that the spin gets double hits. Thunderblade starts and we rush in to break its shield. Then we do another spin, which I forgot to mention, but we usually spin facing away from enemies because you get two hits instead of one. Chugging the Claymore ends phase one. Thunderblade Shield always comes back for phase two, but there's also a timer for when it comes back after the initial break, which is important for how we stun him. To break the shield this time, we pick up the boomerang, which gets auto-equipped saving a bit of menuing, and then use a headshot to knock the blight down. On the fourth boomerang hit, the shield comes back and immediately breaks again, saving for the final spin to win.
And with the blights taken care of, we get to possibly my favorite section of the run, Calamity Ganon. We start off with a quick rush, which is a rare instance of Breathwald combat tech in speedruns. By holding a bomb above his head and then pulling out a weapon before dodging, the bomb gets a drop and acts like a ceiling that forces Link to touch the ground sooner than normal for a faster flurry rush. It saves like one second, but it feels so cool. Then we run over to the bomb arrows and spam headshots as we scrape towards the Royal Claymore, all while waiting for a laser to parry it. Parrying the laser will stun Calamity so we can use the rest of our Royal Guard's Claymore's durability. Then we unload the ancient arrows and break the bow on the final bomb arrow headshot to end phase one. Calamity gets a shield for phase two, making it invincible until you pray a laser. And usually, the shield comes back once you smack it a few times. But we can perform a stun lock by spinning with a two-handed weapon and slamming just as it begins to stand up. With the right timing, this can be repeated until Calamity is dead. Oh, also, the Claymore in this room is guaranteed to have at least a 10% chance of having a modifier, of which it has a 25% chance to be attack up, for a 1 in 40 chance overall. This makes every spin deal more damage, and of course my best blood gets one, which is another reason it's very difficult to match my summon best. And now we have the victory lap. Even if you can somehow manage to die here, you only get sent back to the beginning of the Dark Beast fight. It's a glorified auto-scroller, but honestly, I kind of like it. It's a nice way to wind down after 20 minutes of nerve-wracking gameplay, and it's not like there isn't gameplay to be optimized. The music always starts at the same time, so we can use certain notes as cues for when the weak points appear and fire the arrows before we can even see the targets. If you do it frame perfectly, Zelda doesn't even have time to talk, which I think I get in the next set. But, that's all I have for you on Breath of Wild Any%. Percent. So, as we watch the rest of the run unfold, I'd just like to thank you all for watching. And if you found the video interesting, then leave a like, and maybe you'll enjoy my other scripted content, where I go in-depth about various Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom speedruns. The next video is going to be about how I completely changed Tears of the Kingdom blindfold speedruns, so make sure to subscribe so you don't miss it. And, of course, I wouldn't be telling you about this speedrun if it weren't for the incredible community that's gathered to break the game apart and take it to its limit. So huge shoutouts to all the Breath of the Wild speedrunners, glitch hunters, and routers. If you're interested in trying it out, there are tons of resources and people willing to answer questions in the Breath of Wild speedrun Discord, which I'll link in the description. Seriously, it's an awesome place. The music actually restarts after shooting the second set of weak points, so the next pre-fire is even easier. After one more shot to the beast's belly, the final eye opens. Time ends on the first frame of the explosion, completing what would be a sub-23 minute speedrun. We're still quite a ways away from this being a reality, but I'm sure it won't be too long before it inevitably happens. So stay tuned, and I'll see you in the next video.